Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan and welcome to Central Park. We're happy to have you joining us again for another weekly walk presentation here in Central Park. Of course, we know it still can be a little difficult getting to the park, so we want to continue bringing the park to you, not only through in-person programs, but also through virtual programs, like our longer 45-minute virtual programs and our more informal 30-minute weekly walks, which we'll be attending today. So welcome. Thank you for joining us for a weekly walk titled Tennis Fever, with me, Ryan, on today, September 7th, 2022. As we explore through the park, I do want to again thank you for joining us and supporting us here at the Central Park Conservancy. Maybe familiar with us, we're the nonprofit private organization caring for the park, whose mission is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. I want to thank you for joining us again for another weekly walk where we're going to be together for about 30 minutes and see a bunch of photos from Central Park that were taken over this past week. As we do make our way through the presentation today, you do have uh, the ability to say hello using the chat feature. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature and please just use the Q&A feature for questions. Um, and we will see one other thing pop up. Some visitor polls are launched throughout the walk today. Once everybody has voted in those polls, I'll share the results and we'll see what we're all thinking. One other thing you'll notice is we are continuing to use live transcripts, which are popping up at the bottom of the screen. You do have the ability to turn those off using the live transcript or CC icon located on your Zoom toolbar. Without any further ado, let's begin our walk today titled Tennis Fever. And as you may have guessed, we're going to be visiting the tennis courts of Central Park and talk a little bit about the recreational sport of tennis. One of the reasons we're taking this walk today is because some of you may be aware the U.S. Open is currently happening just actually across the East River over in Flushing Meadows and Corona Point uh, Park in Queens. We see the U.S. Open operating between about August 29th to September 11th, uh, very close by here to Central Park. And of course, we have plenty of tennis courts here to continue that recreational activity and honor the U.S. Open. The U.S. Open actually is one of the oldest tennis champions in the world, uh, ten tennis championships in the world. Uh, began actually around 1881 as a national men's single and doubles competition. The tournament was open only to clubs that were members of the U.S. National Lawn Tennis Association. The event actually expanded to include women's singles in 1887, women's doubles in 1889, and then mixed doubles around 1892. The five championship contests we see occurring uh, would happen at different locales up until about 1968, when all five of these tournaments were hosted at one common site, one we may be familiar with, Forest Hills over in Queens, New York. We see this championship existing there and eventually being renamed the U.S. Open as it eventually moves from Flushing Meadows to its current location in 1978. We'll learn about its pre uh, current location in just a little bit. But as we move into the park, beginning over around the um, about Upper West Side, uh, we are going to be entering at the Gate of All Saints. Now, many of you know that these inscribed gates held to honor different citizens and people that might be using the park. While this Gate of All Saints has more of a religious type of aspect to it, there's a different, different type of saint I'd like to talk about, somebody that's considered really a tennis saint. This is Mayor Dinkins, which we can see here. David Dinkins' picture on the far left was the New York City mayor from 1990 to 1993. He was actually the first African-American mayor in New York City, and he's unofficially named the mayor of the tennis world. As you might have guessed, Dinkins was an avid tennis player, and uh, we can actually see him uh, being a very influential member along on the tennis board as well, the Tennis Association. Uh, we actually see him pictured here with one of the Tennis Association board members, Jennifer Cap uh, Capriti, who's also a tennis champion. And she was quoted as saying, the mayor is one cool dude. We certainly see him being uh, familiar with quite a few tennis players, both uh, locally known and internationally known. He was certainly a fierce competitor and he would play with different tennis pros like Arthur Ashe, John McEnroe, Virginia Wade, and Billie Jean King, who we can see pictured here with uh, David Dinkins. Also a really cool shirt I see he's wearing over there. Uh, but we see him, of course, being an advocator for tennis uh, off the courts as well. Dinkins became involved with several different organizations that aimed to expand tennis's reach beyond its stereotypical country club image, notably uh, the National Junior Tennis League. 
which was actually founded by Arthur Ashe. It introduced tennis to children and teens from low-income families. A quote from Dinkins reads, these programs teach our young people more than just tennis. Um, they reinforced values such as discipline, courteousness, good sportsmanship, team spirit, and responsibility. And they provide our young people with an alternative to the streets and allow them to release creative energy in a positive way. We see Dinkins not only just being a fierce tennis competitor, but also again being a big advocator for keeping tennis and this really historic sport here in New York. One of the things he's best remembered for is helping to make sure the US Open continues to be held here in New York City. When tennis organizers were eager for bigger and better facilities, we see them hinting at finding a new home outside of New York City. Mayor Dinkins during this time was actually able to work out a deal to expand what is now known as the Billie Jean King Tennis Center, including the construction of the Arthur Ashe Stadium. The deal Dinkins secured is heralded as one of New York City's best deals because the $150 million expansion of this stadium and recreational facility would be paid for by the United States Tennis Association rather than the city, but the city would still maintain ownership as well as receive some of the revenue from these venues. We see actually here a picture of Dinkins making the announcement uh, for this expansion. Pictured here is David Dinkins on the left, Arthur Ashe just next to him in the somewhat middle, and John McEnroe on the far right. The tennis world honors Dinkins actually by naming an entrance over in this tennis center after him, as well as his namesake being attached to a few Harlem tennis courts as well. As we snap back to present day, we can go see some of the tennis courts, some of the tradition that was held and kept alive, thanks to Mayor Dinkins. We have lovely weather as we walk through the park, luckily missing some of the rain that we're experiencing today and getting some of that nice sunshine hanging over with the birds flying high. As we make our way down around the shady and sometimes sunny paths, it might not look like we have a tennis center nearby, but some of the signs surrounding us let us know that we're on the right track. As we continue meandering around the paths, we'll enjoy some of the very hot sun, which of course we've traded off for plenty of rain uh, yesterday and today. But of course, it's a very surprisingly cool and relaxing area along this Upper West Side, where we find many different meadows and areas that allow us a little bit of quiet, peaceful picnicking. We also can see some pretty interesting trees in this area as well, um, as we see this one, which not only providing a shade, but also providing an interesting little aesthetic to the landscaper walking around. The umbrella-like tree that we see here is not only providing shade, but an intriguing look. The look is coming from none other than an Austrian pine tree, which we can actually find several of, several of throughout the park, although not all of them might take on this very interesting umbrella shape. Austrian pine trees, as you might have guessed from the name, are not indigenous to the area, but they're quickly becoming a very utilized species because they're really good at dealing with urban environments, mainly because this is a hardy species that can really take on a lot of polluted areas with high salinity and even salinity in the air and ground as well. The interesting shape that we see here is actually quite of a typical growth for mature Austrian pine trees which tend to have drooping lower lying branches that are eventually lost as the tree matures, eventually getting a more flat top crown that spreads out like the one we see here. A really interesting tree and one of my favorite along this little route that we get to pass by. As we pass and continue uh, making our way through the park, we'll head a little bit over towards the east where we can start to just barely see something popping up across the road. As we make our way across the road, we can find a couple interesting little features here, like this piece of architecture, which is helping us hydrate, a fountain that almost appears to be chiseled out of the bedrock of New York City, Manhattan Chist. But rather, this is actually created using black granite, which looks eerily similar to the Chist. What we see here is a fountain that was dedicated in 1991, and it's a gift from the 72nd Street Marathoning and Pasta Club, who would actually help to fund the restoration of some water fountains around the park, as well as help to plant some trees. But we can see this little water fountain providing us a great little way to hydrate off along this West Side Drive, whether we're using the running road, uh, maybe picnicking off the side and getting a little too warm, or maybe coming back from playing tennis and we need to stay hydrated. Of course, it's always important to hydrate up when you come to Central Park. 
And that goes for both two-legged and four-legged visitors of the park. Really happy here to see these two little bowls that were left over here, helping to hydrate some of Central Park's four-legged friends as well. We can find a few different dog drinking fountains actually throughout the park, but sometimes when there aren't ones nearby, we see some generous people leaving bowls to again, hydrate everybody that might be visiting Central Park. As we start to make our way a little bit closer to the tennis center, we're actually starting to get a glimpse of this pretty massive building or massive area within Central Park, but one that's pretty hidden thanks to all the wonderful trees that we can find nearby. As we do come over towards the tennis courts, I'd like to share a poll for you. This is a simple one. Have you ever played tennis? If so, have you ever played tennis in Central Park? Central Park actually sports the largest public uh, array or public collection of tennis courts in New York City. So if you have played in New York, there's maybe a decent chance you've played here in Central Park. As we make our way a little bit further to the east, we can start to get a more expansive view of these tennis courts, um, as well as something else. You might be able to see something kind of just tucked in between the top left of this tree over there. If I bring that little circle up, you might be able to see a little bit closer, or maybe not because it's pretty tiny. What we're looking at in that little red circle is gonna be a plane. Now it's no surprise playing tennis or any sport in New York City or just about any urban area has its distractions. Even the US Open has had some noise pollution from planes. Although this was actually yet another thing that Mayor Dinkins had fought to reduce. Close to the location of Arthur Ashe Stadium where the US Open is held is LaGuardia International Airport which you can imagine has quite a few planes coming and going. Along with the deal for the new stadiums, a piece of legislation was also worked in by Mayor Dinkins that would actually fine the city upwards of $325,000 if there were excessive flyovers from LaGuardia during the time of the US Open. We would actually see this later being overturned by another mayor, but just one of the steps Dinkins would make to help again, reduce some of the noise pollution of the city and help to again, foster a great home for this certainly beloved tennis competition here in the United States. As we continue on, we can get a little bit of a glimpse of just some of the about 30 courts that exist over here. As we walk along the southern edge, we can see some of the 26 clay courts, as well as the four hard courts, which are pictured in the back. We would see permanent courts being created in Central Park around about 1910, practically in the same exact place where tennis historically was played back in the 19th century. As we move a little bit more towards the east, we can see a building that sits just on the south edge of the tennis courts. This is the home base for tennis players. It's the tennis center. In 1930, a field house was built to help to uh, support the players coming here to play tennis. The building would actually be the first completely new building added to the park in the 20th century. A uh, building actually was almost even torn down too in the uh, middle to late 20th century. But luckily we would see instead of it being torn down and receiving renovations that would allow this building to continue to operate. The buildings usually open between about 6.30 and 7 p.m. Um, during the tennis season, which is from April to November. As the sun, though, does start to uh, go down a little bit, we do see, I believe, that hour shrinking down to about 6 p.m. during October and the uh, later fall season. But as we continue and make our way into the tennis center, we can actually see what lies instead, uh, what lies inside, such as some of the amenities like a pro shop. So if you're visiting Central Park and you maybe forgot your racket, have no fear, you can certainly stop in here and pick up some new material. You might also notice that little sign up top, which notes that the pro shop is doing a 25% off sale while the US Open is occurring. And again, that's occurring until September 11th. So you have until Sunday to get deals on tennis equipment over here. But beyond just getting, of course, gifts or items from the tennis pro shop, you can also visit and you can, of course, use the locker rooms to change into your tennis gear and maybe grab a snack before or after you're done playing. Inside here, we can certainly find the full tennis schedule, getting again the exact times of when they're open, both um, days as well as again physical times of the day. You can also see a little bit of information about how to acquire a permit to play tennis, because in order to play uh, tennis, softball, or really any sport in New York City parks, you do have to acquire a permit first, just so of course there can be a little bit more scheduling and better order to who gets to play, and just we don't have any conflict on or off the court. 
but visiting the Arsenal building located near the Central Park Zoo is just one way that you can acquire a permit in person. However, visiting NewYorkCityParks.gov is an easy way to apply through an online application. And of course, we have until November 13th with this uh, building and court area being open, so you still have plenty of time to make it to Central Park and play a little tennis if you'd like. One interesting thing that occurs in here is the restringing of tennis rackets. And although no one was stringing a racket upon our visit today, we can remember one of the last times we visited this area and we were able to see live stringing in person. Uh, tennis racket strings can be made from a number of different materials, such as natural gut. Uh, natural gut or cat gut, as it's referred to, is a cord that's made from the intestines of certain animals, particularly sheep. Uh, natural gut and nylon strings are best for beginner and intermediate players due to their power and comfort properties, while polyester is better for advanced players because it's a little stiffer and has more of a control oriented property to it. But no matter the string material, it's always interesting to see these rackets coming to life manually, of course, rather than seeing a machine operating it, but rather somebody that's actually interested in tennis. So if you do stop by the tennis center, you can keep an eye out for some of the uh, wonderful employees here that certainly know a lot about tennis and how to, of course, set up the equipment. As we come to the back edge of the tennis center, I will just share that poll that I launched a little bit earlier, which is a simple one. Again, have you ever played tennis? And if you have, have you ever played in Central Park? And it looks like about 80% of people have played tennis before, but of course, it's like 75% have not played in Central Park. So it looks like some of you have some um, tennis bucket list items to check off. Coming and visiting Central Park, you can find the largest collection of publicly available tennis courts in New York City. So it's certainly a really great and historic spot to stop and play tennis. We'll actually learn a little bit about the history of tennis in just a moment or so. But as we make our way to this back area and step on the back patio, we get a great area to relax, eat, and of course, watch some tennis from a more elevated viewpoint. Looking over the courts, um, we can look over an activity that has really been occurring in Central Park for over, over 140 years. And this actually would first begin being played in Central Park in around the early 1880s, which is pretty amazing because Central Park was created between 1858, about 1873. So it's one of the first initial activities we begin seeing, or one of the first recreational type of activities we see really making its way into Central Park. Oops. And of course, uh, we see the courts looking a little different back then. In this photographed image, we can see here, uh, coming from the Museum of the City of New York, we can see how different the courts were. While the general area in which tennis was played on was largely the same, the courts were set up on meadows rather than a more permanent concrete or hard court. The nets that were set up were temporary and the borders were actually drawn out with chalk so that the lawn could be used for other purposes beyond tennis. This stereograph image that we see here though sure, certainly shows the popularity of tennis and how many people were really stopping by to play. This photo coming from about 1896, so about a decade or so after tennis was starting to be played here in Central Park. And of course, a lot of amazing um, images we can see from these historic stereographs and other images taken during this time. This image here from 1885 shows a little closer of a view of a of course, mixed, it looks like a mixed doubles match being played here. Traditionally, tennis was actually played on the grass. This kept the ball bounced low below the knee, which allowed for more of a serving and volley play rather than maybe more of our bounce play, which we see often today. In fact, the US Open played on grass courts until 1975. At that time, they would switch to clay courts before about three years later in 1978, changing to the hard courts that are used today. We'll actually see an example of the hard court that looks very similar to the court the US Open has played on in a little bit. As we continue beyond though, we can snap back to present day time. And of course, a bit has changed as we do not see uh, grass courts being used anymore. We do of course have the largest offering of public tennis courts here with 30 total courts. And most of the cards that we see here today are clay type material that are known as hard true. Hard true, often referred to as fast dry, is a crushed stone product that dries quicker and allows players to play through a light rain and even holds about a 10 to 15 degree cooler difference than a hard court will. 
Caring for the cords is a little different though than caring for grass cords, as you may have imagined. Here we can actually see the cords getting watered. Might be asking, what does water do for a court? Doesn't that kind of uh, reverse the effects we're going for? The water actually helps keep a court firm. It gives it a rich and dark color and it ensures stable footing for players. Beyond that, we of course see proper hydration of these courts, minimizing the erosion and keeping the uh, border tape actually in place. The water on the courts um, also allows for water to evaporate during play, which will help keep the court and its players a little bit cooler as well. We also see properly hydrated courts draining more quickly, if you could believe it or not, and they actually help to reduce bad bounces. On top of watering, grooming, of course, is done as well, which we can see pictured here. This helps reduce the debris and flipping hazards on the course and other types of materials that could ultimately lead to damage or even mold or bacteria or mildew forming on the course. Something, of course, we look to avoid. And it's always important, I think, to remember that, of course, we um, can't take care of the park just by ourselves. It, of course, takes even more than a city to care for Central Park's 843 acres. And this little plaque in the back of the tennis center honors one of, one of the many philanthropists and people that have donated to help again, keep these areas looking beautiful, clean, green, and in operation. Uh, Felix Marx, who we can see honored here on this plaque, is again a donor who would help keep these courts in operation, especially during a time when I mentioned they were almost gonna be torn down. So we do want to thank everybody again that helps keep this park look as beautiful and clean as it does, because of course it's beyond just the Central Park Conservancy, it's all of us pitching in to make sure this park looks beautiful and stays clean and green. As we exit the Tennis Center, we're uh, very lucky to find a little souvenir, a tennis ball that seemed to escape the uh, fenced in area, lands just below our feet, and we have a little buddy to take with us on the rest of our walk. So as we walk along the borders of these tennis courts today, we can get a little different perspective as we step off the court and start walking around. Walking around the perimeter of the courts, we can certainly get some nice front and level views of people playing games. And of course, a great spot to spectate tennis matches are from the benches that surround these courts. Whether it's in the sun or the shade, there's no bad place to catch a glimpse of a game. And seeing these benches reminds me of some of the many of pe many people that are honored by benches in the park, like one that honors Billie Jean King. This bench isn't found up near the tennis courts, but it's rather found down near 72nd Street and Bow Bridge right across from the lake. This uh, bench, which honors Billie Jean King, was actually gifted to her um, on her 50th birthday by some of her friends here in New York. And if you do visit Central Park, beyond just having an opportunity to play tennis, you never know who you could run into. People like John McEnroe have been known to play on the tennis courts over here, or you might even run into Billie Jean herself, which we can see here pictured on her bench. Uh, this being a photo that Billie Jean King shared on her Twitter account just uh, in a few years ago in 2018 on a stop by to the park. And of course, we can see Billie Jean frequenting the park, not only to visit her bench, but also in the past, helping to lead a lot of tennis programs and events that have occurred here. Uh, Billie Jean helping to assist with these tennis camps that again, aim to bring, uh, bring in younger players and expand its reach to wider audiences. So we certainly see a lot of wonderful te tennis legends calling the park home. As we walk along the outsides of the park and along these tennis courts, or rather the outskirts of these tennis courts, we can look over some of the very same courts that Billie Jean herself, Arthur Ashe, and John McEnroe have played on. And we can admire the history these courts provide us. One, well, one thing we'll notice is as we're walking along the west side of these courts, we take a glance to our left, it doesn't even look like we're in a tennis facility anymore. It looks like we're in the middle of almost like a woodland or something like that. And that's some of the beauty of these tennis courts. Every which angle you get a little bit more of a naturalistic park view. And what you'll notice from along the west side is that this section of the fence line does have a little bit of a privacy tarp put on. While of course it does still allow us to see through, the idea for this is to kind of provide a little bit of a cover or a little bit of a hiding of the players over there. Mainly so when we're walking on the side, walking on some of these naturalistic paths, we don't notice maybe the, um, again, human-made infrastructure sitting just over to our right. A simple little effect that actually has a very uh, nice effect as we walk through the park on this side. 
again, feeling like we're not in the middle of a recreational facility anymore, but rather just in the middle of an expansive park, which we certainly are. As we make our way down the path, we'll head to our final stop. And along the way, we can stop by some of the four hard courts that are found up along the northern edge of the tennis courts and center. These hard courts, if you have been watching the open, you might notice the similarity both in color and material. These are the same types of courts that are used on the uh, US Open now. They're typically a, um, a concrete base that are covered with a type of acrylic on top. Um, there might be another layer or two of something on there, but of course, creating a pretty sturdy bounce and uh, being pretty hardy, um, not really too damaging in terms of eroding, much like the clay courts might. But we see these courts up here, not only again, matching the ones used to the open, but also helping to bridge the game to a wider audience and specifically a lot of youth, as the four courts up here are primarily used for a lot of the tennis camps, different schools and other programs that are held here in Central Park. So as you stop by the park, you can not only play a game, but you might be able to see a future tennis champion honing in on their skills. As we make our way just along the corner of these hard courts, we'll come to our final stop to take a nice little view out over these courts, making our way along the corner and sharing just one final reminder. That reminder being to, of course, use the proper materials when you're coming on these courts, wear the proper tennis sneakers so we can reduce again the damage that might occur on these courts. These courts, again, being one of the uh, few areas of the park that aren't actually maintained by us at the Central Park Conservancy, but are rather maintained by the Parks Department. So, of course, we do want to make sure these areas remain beautiful for everybody to utilize. And these areas, of course, for good reason, deserve uh, preservation. Not only do they support the immense history of the sport, which started back in the park in the early 1880s, but they provide us, again, the largest collection of publicly offered tennis courts in New York City, as well as, again, just immaculate views, like this one we can see up here of the El Dorado, as people, of course, compete for um, the honor of winning a, a tennis match here in Central Park but beautiful views to be had around. And as we do come to the end of our walk, I do encourage those who maybe haven't had the opportunity to play tennis in the park to maybe stop by and play. As I did mention, permits are required to play on courts like this or just about all of the baseball or softball time in the park, but they're very easy and affordable to acquire. I believe you can actually get a permit for the entire year for about $50 or more, but have to double check me on that. But again, visiting the parksdepartment.gov website, you can find more information on permits. I do want to thank you, though, for joining us on this little route that you can see pictured here. And do want to remind you, there are plenty of areas to explore. As we visit areas like the tennis courts, a lot of people don't make it up there. Another area a lot of people don't visit is the northern end of the park. So if you're around, we'd love to see you on one of our hidden highlights of the North End Tour, which are going to be occurring on some of the dates pictured on this screen here. This offers you a wonderful look into a lesser visited area of the park and covers a wide array of different information from history to ecology to really even um, free park information, which is really cool. So we'd love to see you attending uh, in person or any programs that are offered. Of course, you can check the chat box for links to these programs. Um, as well as check our website for other programs that are gonna be happening, both in-person, virtual, as well as beyond tours, events like our Halloween events, which will be coming up in just a few months. I will tell you more about that later down the road, but thank you everybody again for joining us today. I am gonna be keeping this open for a little bit longer in case we have any unanswered questions that we can get to. But otherwise, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well. See you soon.